The book has produced a vintage betting year this time round. We've seen two favourites. Uh, Beryl Bainbridge was the initial favourite, but all of a sudden everybody wanted to back Graham Swift, and he was back down to even money after at one stage we took 38 bets in an hour for him, which is more the sort of level of business you expect to see for a potential derby favourite. Beryl drifted out to 4 to 1 third favourite in the face of a gamble on Margaret Atwood, who came down to 5 to 2 second favourite. At 5 to 1 fourth favourite is Sheena McKay, who was backed from 10 to 1. Rahinta Mystery drifted out to 10 to 1, and Seamus Dean is the 14 to one outsider, which doesn't mean he can't win. I would like to see Graham Swift win tonight. I think it's a fantastic book, um, fantastic culmination of a marvellous career to date, and my personal favourite. If the jury wants to give it to something which is more um, ambitious and more, more elegant and more, with more variety of contrivance, then it ought to be Margaret Atwood. The actual best written book of the lot is, uh, is Seamus Dean's Reading in the Dark. Though. But that's incontrovertibly autobiography, not novel, not fiction. I love the Bainbridge and I love the Atwood and I think Swift will win. I think probably I'd have lobbied for Margaret Atwood because I enjoyed it so incredibly much. I thought it had enormous narrative power, historical strength. It taught me things. She writes very beautifully. It entertained me. It enthralled me. It kept me up at night. That's what you want from a novel. I think if I'd been a judge myself, it would have been Margaret Atwood's book because that's the one in the end that I got the biggest sort of um, soul feeling from, if you like. I really found it a very deeply affecting and beautifully written book. They're all good books, but I have to admit I do have two favourites. One is Graham Swift's, which I think is close to a perfect book, and the other is the wonderful lyrical Seamus Dean. and welcome to the most prestigious literary event of the year, the presentation of the 1996 Booker Prize for Fiction, coming to you as ever live from Guildhall in London. We've just heard a few varying opinions from guests as they arrive for tonight's dinner, which is now in full swing, as you can see. The six shortlisted authors are all here tonight, as are the judging panel, who have had to pick the best novel of the year by a British or Commonwealth writer. They reached their decision earlier this evening, but they must sit tight on it for a short while yet, until the chair of the judges, Carmen Khalil, announces who has won this year's prize, which is worth £20,000 and a huge boost in publicity and sales. Before that announcement, we'll be hearing more about the six books that are vying for tonight's prize from Sarah Dunant and our own panel of critics, who are right here at Guildhall. Thank you, Tracy. Well, now in its 28th year, the Booker remains the award in the literary calendar, a calendar which over the last decade has become positively stuffed with prizes, not least the new 30,000 Orange Prize for Fiction, which arrived this year trailing clouds of controversy because it was open only to women. Back in Bookerland, there is not a hint of sexism in this year's shortlist, which divides firmly down the middle with three men and three women. In fact, until now, it was about the only divide visible in a year which has been remarkably harmonious in the judging, with the chair, Carmen Khalil, publicly celebrating the health of the novel and castigating any who might disagree. Well, today, one dissenter went public when the former Booker winner and highly regarded writer V.S. Naipaul was quoted as saying the prize was useless and that the modern novel was debris, new characters in old work. The words of an old man in a new age or fair comment. Our own panel of judges add their views in a moment when they get their hands on the shortlist. First, back to Tracy McLeod and the writers. Thanks, Sarah. Well, all the shortlisted authors are here this evening. The rest of the gathering comes from publishing, business, politics, and the media, including some well-known faces. Literary heroine Elizabeth Bennett is here in the form of actress Jennifer Ely, who was a prize winner herself at this year's BAFTAs for her performance in Pride and Prejudice and actor Richard E. Grant, who made his own literary debut this year with his film diaries with Nails. From the world of politics, Virginia Bottomley, MP, Minister for the Arts and Heritage, whose all-time favourite novel is apparently House of the Spirits by Isabel Allende. And the Labour politician, Claire Short, who's accompanied by her son, Toby, with whom she was recently reunited in a story as dramatic as any novel. From publishing, the first couple of literary New York, Harold Evans, president and publisher of Random House, together with his wife, Tina Brown, editor of The New Yorker. Also here are some of the authors who've appeared on the shortlist in previous years, including Malcolm Bradbury, who was nominated for Rates of Exchange in 1983, and regular attender Ben Ockrey, who won the Booker Prize in 1991 with The Famished Road. And spread among the crowd are this year's six shortlisted authors. 
Margaret Atwood was born in Ottawa and is Canada's most celebrated contemporary writer. She has already been shortlisted for the Booker Prize twice before, for The Handmaid's Tale in 1986 and again in 1989 for Cat's Eye. Her book this year is Alias Grace, her ninth novel, and the bookmaker's closing odds on her were 5-2, to two, which makes her second favourite. Making her fourth appearance on the shortlist, Beryl Bainbridge has never yet won the Booker Prize, and she's nominated this year for her 15th novel, Every Man for Himself. Beryl Bainbridge started as a favourite this year, but her odds have since lengthened to 4-1, to one, making her third favourite. Seamus Dean has reached the shortlist this year with his first novel, but he already has a considerable reputation as a poet. He was born in Derry and has pursued an academic career in Ireland and the United States. Seamus Dean's, Seamus Dean's book is Reading in the Dark, and the bookmakers have him as this year's outsider at 14 to 1. Sheena Mackay was born in Edinburgh, raised in Kent, and now lives in London. She left school at 16 and had her first novel published when she was only 20. She's nominated for her sixth novel, The Orchard on Fire, and the closing odds on Sheena Mackay were 5 to 1. Rowinton Mystery is, at 44, the youngest author on this year's shortlist. He was born in Bombay and since 1975 has lived in Canada. His first novel, Such a Long Journey, was booker shortlisted in 1991 and he's nominated again this year for A Fine Balance. The novel is long and the odds on Rowinton Mystery winning are also long. They closed at 10 to 1. And finally, this year's favourite, Graham Swift. He was born in London and was shortlisted for the booker in 1983 for Waterland. His book this year is Last Orders, and he closed as the even money favourite. Well, those are the shortlisted authors. To tell you more about their books, back to Sarah Dunant and her guests. Thank you, Tracy. Well, in just over 20 minutes, the bookies pay up, and one of those writers gets their hands on a cheque for 20 grand. Before then, our studio panel here at Guildhall gets their hands on the books. With me are the writer and critic, Jermaine Greer, the novelist, Michael Dibden, and the poet and critic Tom Paulin. The first two novels to go under the hammer are Beryl Bainbridge's Every Man for Himself and Margaret Atwood's Alias Grace. Beryl Bainbridge's Every Man for Himself is set on the Titanic and it tells the stories of a group of passengers travelling together on the upper decks. The voyage and the characters are seen through the eyes of a young man, Morgan, whose illusions about life and his place in the world are gradually stripped away as the ship moves nearer to its destiny. I think I've, I've always been obsessed by the first decade of, of this century in that um, I think people could believe in the idea of um, patriotism and, and dying for the flag and the fact that a whole group of men could stand on the deck of a sinking liner and decide to go down with the ship rather than fight their way into the lifeboats. I don't know how long I swam under that lidded sea. Time had stopped with my breath. And just as it seemed my lungs would burst, the blackness paled and I kicked to the surface. I had thought I was entering paradise, for I was alive and about to breathe again. And then I heard the cries of souls in torment and believed myself in hell. Dear God, those voices. Some called for their mothers, some on the Lord, some to die quickly, a few to be saved. The lamentations ran through the frosty air and touched the stars. My own mouth opened in a silent howl of grief. The cries went on and on, trembling, lingering. And God forgive me, but I wanted them to end. In all that ghastly night, it was the din of the dying that chilled the most. Alias Grace by Margaret Atwood is set in Canada in the mid-19th century and is based on the true story of one Grace Marks, a young servant girl who was charged with the murder of her employer and his mistress. The book, told through various voices, including Grace's own, explores the nature of memory, truth and storytelling. I think it's about the attitudes of people towards her which were complicated by the fact that she was a woman. And it appears to be true that in double crimes, that is, when a man and a woman are both charged with committing a violent crime, opinion is not divided about the man, but it is divided about the woman. It splits. Innocent victim coerced by fear, 
instigator of the whole thing, female demon. And so it was with Grace Marks in 1843. The reason they wanted to see me is that I am a celebrated murderess, or that is what has been written down. When I first saw it, I was surprised because they say celebrated singer and celebrated poetess and celebrated spiritualist and celebrated actress. But what is there to celebrate about murder? All the same, murderess is a strong word to have attached to you. It has a smell to it, that word, musky and depressive like dead flowers in a vase. Sometimes at night I whisper it over to myself, murderous, murderous. It rustles like a taffeta skirt across the floor. Murderer is merely brutal. It's like a hammer or a lump of metal. I would rather be a murderess than a murderer if those are the only choices. Well, let's start these two books, both of them, take fact and turn them into fiction. Let's start with Bell Brainbridge and that doomed ship. Germaine Greer, it's a hell of a big story to tell. Is the book big enough to tell it? I must admit I was disconcerted by the thought that you could take a massive human tragedy, that's the wrong word, tragedy, but a disaster, and turn it into a sort of novel of manners with the shipwreck providing you with an easy out. Because, and I, I couldn't understand certain games that were played, like not telling you it was the Titanic for a few pages until you began saying to yourself, surely this has to be the Titanic. And then it does odd things like use the actual passenger list for the Titanic. So some of the people who are mentioned in passing are real people, like the Strausses, you know, and the, the, the department store owners in New York. And they're sort of, they're stage dressing for what I think is a fairly lightweight novel and slightly gothic-y, um, an extraordinary reliance on uh, coincidence to give the story uh, some kind of artistic form. I'm getting the impression that you don't like it very much. I'll come back to you in the a second. The thing is, I think Beryl's a wonderful writer. I just wish this <laughs> wasn't the book that was in for her because she deserves a prize of some sort. OK, Tom Pauline, what did you think of it? I thought extraordinary. I mean, um, really marvellous stylist, huge authority, and the, 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 the sensuous delight in the surfaces and the different characters. And I thought this is a bit like uh, a film I don't much like last year at Marion Bad. Um, that is set on board the Titanic. And then there are wonderful r remarks like, unlike most Englishmen, he lacked apathy. Very laid back, very subtle, very strange atmosphere, couldn't quite work out what was going on. Then at the same time, I felt rather like Germain, uh, the stylistic brilliance was one at the expense of a kind of humanity. So we saw on, on, on the clip the description of the ship going down and the cries of, of the doomed passengers. Well, I have heard one, one of the survivors describe that scene and it's heartrending. And of course, the, the, the style is not able to encompass that. Uh, that was a very good extract, I thought. I mean, I thought you got real power from it. Um, uh, Michael Dibden, I, I loved the beginning. I thought yeah. it was going to be a great book when I Absolutely. started. Yeah. It became a bit more and more like a movie I almost yeah. thought I'd seen as it continued. The, the opening chapter was, I think, the best of, of, of uh, opening chapters on this list. It was absolutely wonderful. It, it had uh, Beryl's usual elliptical, oblique take. Uh, it, it, her books often seem to me as if she's written them out in the normal way and then gone through and crossed out every other sentence. Um, and you know, th that, was, that, was, that was wonderful. Once we got on board the ship and as Germaine said, once we realised which ship it was, um, it seemed to me that she was falling between two stools. One was telling an anecdote about one particular passenger on this ship, uh, and of course an anecdote to which we all know the ending. Um, and the other was striving for some sort of um, ship of fools idea of the kind that Fellini used, for example, in uh, And the Ship Sails On, in which case you need other voices. You need voices from steerage, you need voices from the engine compartment, you need greater variety and greater depth. It's interesting that yeah. we've all, in fact, picked images of movies to go with it, and I think that's that's, right. that's, yeah. that's yeah. very clear. And I'm going to have to move you on, because otherwise I know there are going to be writers we're not going to cover. Um, let's then move to the other book on this list, which very obviously takes fact and turns it into fiction, although an infinitely lesser-known story, which is Margaret Atwood's Alias Grace, the story of this young serving girl who did or didn't commit a murder. We never quite find out. Tom Pullins, a lot of people who think Margaret Atwood ought to have won the booker before and therefore kind of ought to win it with this. 
Well, I, I mean, I, I came to this novel having read uh, The Edible Woman, thought it was very good, then tried to teach a dreadful one called The Handmaid's T Tale, and a, a, and a group of very bright students said, yeah. no, 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 and can't this, do it. And, and then I read here, this, yeah. and I thought, well, I, I, I'm going with this, I'm sticking with it. And then I thought, no, it's like a cross between Mrs. Beaton and True Detective. <laughs> There's something sort of tacky about it. I, I felt tainted by it. I felt there was a kind of clinical nullness at the heart of it. A very brilliant scene where uh, you, you realise that, that the central character, the, 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 the murderer, Grace Marks, has been taken over by the spirit of a young woman she knew who died. But then you thought, well, where is the exorcism? Uh, wh where's the payoff for that? It just disappears. Michael Dibden, this is the book that stayed with me more than any on the list after I finished reading it. Did it stay with you? Well, it stayed with me while I was reading it for much longer than uh, I wished it had. It seems to me there are two winning strategies for faction. You either go for plausibility. The reader thinks, yes, this is probably what happened on the basis of the historical record. Or you go for imaginative slant. The reader thinks, hmm, I'm not sure if that's what happened, but it gives me an interesting take on the facts and indeed on the human condition and all the other things. I think uh, Margaret Atwood has succeeded in doing neither. Um, I didn't believe her, her, her account of the, of, of the crime, and it's, I didn't find it particularly interesting. I think what she's done essentially is expanded an anecdote into an epic with massive injections of the mawkish victimology, which is so prevalent in North American writing these days, and scads of research taken from the many, many books which she uh, quotes in her appendix, one of which, incidentally, is one of the great must-read not titles of all time, called 300 what? Years of Canadian Quilt. Okay, okay, it's clear the boys don't like it. Germaine, do you like it any better? Well, again, I think Margaret should have won a booker, but not for this book. Uh, perhaps for surfacing, or for the edible woman, or something. Um, my problem with it was, well, actually, one of the things I really liked about it was the way it refers to other women's writing. There's a whole section in the middle of the book where Grace sounds like Nellie Dean. You think I've heard this voice before, this correcting voice in Wuthering Heights, the person who says, no, no, sir, that's not what I would say, or yes, madam, but uh, this kind of slightly sententious um, commentator on the action. But the point is, of course, that Grace is responding to everybody's demands from her. But isn't really, that part Grace of the doesn't book? Exist. Yes, it is. That's the point of the book. And the point of the book is that, well, there's a number of problems here. I mean, Margaret is working out how to make her own. That she had written a book about Grace Marks in which she had fallen for Susanna Moody's argument. And she was angry about this and she tried to correct the record. And so she's written a much greater book. But it's deeply flawed and I don't think it, right. She should be premiated for this when she hasn't been for other things. Okay, we will move on to the second two books on the list then, which are Seamus Dean's Reading in the Dark and Sheena Mackay's The Orchard on Fire. Seamus Dean's Reading in the Dark is the story of a working class Catholic boy growing up in Londonderry in the 40s and 50s. His childhood interweaves the harsh reality of poverty and politics with a mythic fantasy world where the heroism of Irish folk tales provides a counterpoint to the secrets and sectarian divisions within his family. The novel's about uh, two family secrets and the relationship between the private family griefs and the private secrets that haunt the whole family down the generations from the 1920s, which are also allied with the, the political and social developments of Northern Ireland since its foundation. What I was trying to achieve in this novel was, in one sense, to write a political parable about Northern Ireland from the 40s to the present day. At another level, I was trying to demonstrate that uh, if you have a coercive or in some way poisonous political situation, that this is something that intervenes in and pollutes to the very heart of the private life. The feud. Did it really start in that farmhouse at Cockhill, outside Buncrana? The one with the raftered ceiling and the walls lined with books? Was it really from the wooden floor of that farmhouse that my father swept up my brother and me, followed by my mother, into years of silence? Was it really because he had found out that his sisters were not really living in the house but were being treated by the family as skivvies and had to sleep in the outhouse beside the chickens? I remember the great rafters as I rose up in his arms and the dusty road outside when he put me down and their voices above us 
and the sky above them filling with a great hammerhead cloud off the Atlantic. We never saw the farmhouse again. Sheena Mackay's The Orchard on Fire is another story of growing up in post-war Britain, this time in the calmer waters of the county of Kent, where young April comes with her family to open a tea room in the early 50s. There she meets Ruby, and the book centres on the intense friendship of the two eight-year-old girls. A five-barred gate to be climbed, not opened, led into the orchard. A dark green and purple-blue paradise, where bloomy plums dropped from the low trees into your hands. What made the orchard miraculous, though, was an abandoned railway carriage in the far corner, set down as if by magic, its wheels gone, anchored by long grass and nettles, with brambles barring its door. Ruby and I stared at it, and at each other. Any enclosed space can inspire a primitive fear of death or danger, supernatural or human. The orchard became lonely and silent as we gazed. I set it in Kent in the 50s because I wanted to evoke the, the lush, idyllic sense of landscape and the freedom that the children had then. But I, I also wanted to introduce a more sinister element which comes from an elderly man who falls in love with one of the little girls and she is unable to tell her parents what's going on. I wanted to show how childhood experiences and loss had um, affected somebody's character and in a sense made her the person she is today. In remembering the past, one inevitably makes elisions and takes meteorological liberties drops stitches, embroiders, and unpicks. It was true that I had kept a journal for many years, but looking back, I must admit that many of my childish entries read only, wrote my diary. A bowl of purple plums blooms on my table. I was unable to walk past the greengrocer's sign that said Kentish plums. Two books about childhood. Michael did, and let's start with Seamus Dean. A very intense, finely crafted book. Did you like it? I loved it. For me, this was the gem of the list. It was the one that made me, as Nabokov says somewhere, jump up, ruffling my hair. Um, and I think for two reasons. The, the prose is simply in a completely different league from any of the other books. This is uh, a poet's prose in, in the right sense. Not poetic prose, but vigorous, exact, surprising, and memorable. Um, secondly, the structure. Um, it, 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 a novel that starts uh, rather as if it's going to be what Americans call Kodak moments, you know, as a selection of snapshots from the family album, suddenly turns out to be a murder mystery, basically. Um, and you are forced to reassess your reading of those, of those earlier chapters in exactly the same way as the protagonist, the narrator, is forced to reass reassess his own experiences as, he, as, as details fill in. OK. Tom Paulin. I, I too loved it. I think it has one of the most haunting descriptions of a mental breakdown in it, which is his mother. Yeah, and it's yeah. so painful to look at because it's seen through the boy's eyes. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, this is the novel I want to win. It, it won't win. It's an extraordinary novel. It's got this in, in, in intenseness and uh, absolute concentration, sense of being born into this messed up province, being thrown into Irish history deeply disinterested, uh, the treatment of the RUC is very, very balanced and, 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 and even and, and, and decent, and there's this tremendous sense of anxiety and being messed up by the, the, the history of the province. So it's a very, very powerful work. Jermaine, we have two clear winners here. I would go a step further and say that one of the points about this book is it tries to rescue the Irish situation from journalism mm -hmm. and show you how this dense human skein is tragic. It's not something that can be written out by a law or something like that. And the terrible thing at the end, when the army come in, you realize that into this human skein, which is human-sized and hurts at every pore, there comes this shaft of steel, which is going to make everybody suffer and give everybody, give an extra dimension to the horror of it. I think it's, it's a great book, but it has flaws. It falls apart a bit towards the end. I wish he didn't get a first-class honours degree, for example. I could do it without that It gets a little bit. rushed at the end, doesn't it? It catapults I itself I think it, it needed something more daring. It needed to abandon the sonatina form, the variations on a theme, and go for a big coda. Well, but the construction of each individual bit is 
so satisfying. It begins with a moment, the moment expands into the present or the past or the landscape or whatever, and then comes back to this dying fall again. Like it is I think stupendous. It, I think it's, it's wonderful. It, it's also worth saying that this is, to use that much abused word, self-referential in the, in the best sense. I mean, it's, it's, it's called Reading the Dark for, for, for a reason, obviously. Exactly. It's a story about stories, about myth, about history, about the stories your culture tells you, your family tells you. These stories are you. You cannot reject them without rejecting yourself. And yet, you uh, are aware that they are manipulating you in various ways. I think it's a very, very subtle take on the, uh, as Tom was saying, the whole situation in Northern Ireland. And also, it's the one book which, because of that, uh, touches what's actually happening now. There is a crisis there. This helps us to explain why. It's a beautiful and important book. Well, it is absolutely clear up until now which we think is the best book on this list. Let us therefore move on to this second post-war childhood, very different both in atmosphere and placing, which is Sheena Mackay's Orchard on Fire. Tom, I come to you. There is a suspicion in me that you're not going to like this book. Am I right? Well, no, it's very decent. It's like a sort of Stanley Spencer painting, really. You know, I mean, I have no interest in uh, tea shops in English villages in the 1950s, absolutely not. But there's something very decent uh, about it. There's something lyrical and sad about the imagination behind it. It's a bit like a sort of early George Orwell novel, you know, Keep the Aspidistra Frying or, or um, Clergyman's Daughter, but a bit nostalgic for my taste. Right, OK, Michael Dibden, I could say it's a watercolour. It's meant to be delicate. Yeah. I sort of feel like saying I wanted to cut two adjectives away from every noun. <laughs> well, I think it's interesting that uh, we're all searching for comparisons here. I think Sheena Mackay is a very fine short story writer. I've never been convinced that she's completely at home at novel length. This book did not convince me. Um, it seemed to me uh, sort of... A bit of L.P. Hartley, a bit of H.E. Bates, a bit of very fashionable child abuse and exhaustive, and in my case, exhausting inventories of rooms and clothes and brand name products of the 1950s. It, it, it just never gelled for me. It, it was a story about a couple of schoolgirls with a pass on each other. I couldn't quite understand why this was important. I mean, did the detail add up to a real story? Wait a minute, wait a minute. What this book is really about, it's about a situation in which the year when you were 10, 10 to 11, was the high point of your existence. Uh, and it makes a very good case that these two little girls lived in a state of heightened awareness of each other, passionate devotion to each other, which is entirely undemanding in, a, in one way. It doesn't demand any kind of gentle satisfaction. Uh, and nobody understood it, least of all them. They didn't understand what was going on. And then it was over. It was just over because they were children and they were moved in different directions. And all their stories stopped. So it's, it's a vivid icon of that childish apprehension of the world as a series of objects to be touched and fingered, this extraordinary uh, physical closeness to things, and then it's, it's embedded in this kind of grey felt matrix of the middle-aged woman's life, which is utterly dreary. Right. It's making quite a serious and, and potentially tragic point. You and Michael did read different books. Well, I mean, no, I, I don't think we did, but um, I agree with all that, but it seems to me there's an unearned elegiac quality which comes from the fact that the friend, Ruby, um, is never contacted again, they never get back in touch um, until she discovers the grave. In, 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 I mean, this is not the way... There I, are all sorts of false notes. This is Mr. Greenidge is a false note and the, the, the grave is a false note, but the fact is that they wouldn't have contacted each other again. They were ten. You know, you like it, Germain, yeah? I, I think it's better than other people think it is. And I, I think she's a better writer than other people think she is because it's in a very feminine mode. I mean, the, the, the hymn to childhood, the erection of childlike uh, life as a, as a sort of desideratum is nowadays very old-fashioned. And, and but I think she's done it as well as it can be done. We will leave you with the last word on the Mackay. And that finally brings us to the last two books, which are Rohinton Mysteries of Fine Balance and Graham Swift's Last Orders. Set in the India of the mid-1970s, Rohinton Mysteries of Fine Balance tells the story of four characters whose lives become inextricably linked. Two lower-caste tailors, a student, and a middle-class widow struggling to make ends meet in a city balanced between hope and despair. One evening, while the slow local waited for a signal change, she gazed beyond the railway fence where a stream of black sewer sludge spilled from an underground drain. Men were hauling on a rope that disappeared into the ground. Their arms were dark to the elbows, the black slime dripping from hands and rope. Then a boy emerged out of the earth, clinging to the end of the rope, 
he was covered in the slippery sewer sludge, and when he stood up, he shone and shimmered in the sun with a terrible beauty. Behind him, the slum smoke curled towards the sky, and the hellishness of the place was complete. The book is set in uh, 1975, the year in which Indira Gandhi declared a state of internal emergency. That year seemed to offer a lot of potential with which to test my characters in the area of human dignity, endurance, the human spirit, how much it can withstand. Memories were permanent. Sorrowful ones remained sad even with the passing of time. Yet happy ones could never be recreated, not with the same joy. Remembering bred its own peculiar sorrow. It seemed so unfair that time should render both sadness and happiness into a source of pain. So what was the point of possessing memory? It didn't help anything. In the end, it was all hopeless. Graham Swift's Last Orders follows four working-class men on a drive to Margate to scatter the ashes of their old friend Jack, a butcher by trade. Throughout the journey, they are sidetracked into places and memories which explore both the power and the limitations of their tight-knit East London world. Seems we've always known a bull in Rochester, it's always known us. And we're all thinking the same thing. That it's a pity we just can't carry on sitting here, getting slowly pickled and at peace with the world. It's a pity we're obliged to take Jack on to Margate. Because Jack wouldn't have minded, it, it's even what he would have wanted for us. He gets sweetly slewed on his account. You carry on, lads, don't you worry about me. If he was here now, he'd be recommending it. He'd be doing the same as us. Forget them ashes, fellas. Except if he were here now, it wouldn't be no problem. There wouldn't be no obligation. Although the main thread of the novel is this journey, which is more or less set in the present day and only occupies one day. Uh, we do move around a lot in time in the lives of the characters. We go backwards and forwards, right back to their childhoods, to the time when they first met each other and so on. And we do see some of their involvement in some of the, the larger aspects of time and history. He used to give me all that old Smithfield guff, all that Smithfield blather. Now Smithfield was the true centre, the true heart of London. Leading night, of course, on account of the meat. Our Smithfield wasn't just Smithfield, it was life and death. That's what it was, life and death. Because just across from the meat market, there was St Bart's Hospital. Just across from Bart's was your old Bailey Central Criminal Court on the side of old Newgate Prison, where they used to string them up regular. So what you had in Smithfield was your three M's. Meat, medicine and murders. start with India, Rohinton Mysteries of Fine Balance, a big book, Jermaine. Is it good? I hate this book. I absolutely hate it. I only lived for four months in Bombay, and I taught at the convent school that those Parsi girls probably went to, and I just don't recognise this dismal, dreary city. To, to my mind, it could have been written by any one of those tourists who goes to, America, who goes to India to inspect the toilets. Uh, it, it seems to assume that if you haven't got a flush toilet and you don't use Kleenex tissues, you're subhuman. Uh, there's one stage where Om and Ishbar are asked by somebody, why is it that everything happens to you? Uh, well, they should have answered, because we're in this novel, which is everything <laughs> bad everyone's ever heard about India in emergency. Yeah, right. And he can't yeah. even be bothered to find out about emergency. Mm. He doesn't know anything about emergency. Tom Paulin, the balance is between hope and despair. One character tells us that. It yeah. is very much weighted to despair rather than hope. Well, it's a bit, in a way, like a, you know, a, a cosmic sick, sick joke. But I thought, for all the fact that it's written in very basic prose, for all the fact, you know, a couple go to the cinema and he says they enjoyed the film immensely, that kind of slack writing. <laughs> There's something in it that just sticks with the subject. I mean, like Germain, I've been to Bombay. I remember looking out at the huge shanty towns and thinking, how could you ever write this? How could you write about the poverty? How could you write about the beggars? And he writes about people absolutely at the bottom. He catches something about the cruelty of Indian society and the decency and the co communal kindness. But that is and all he captures. There is very little hope in the novel. Well, why should you read a novel despair. to feel hopeful? Why not to feel depressed? Michael. 
Well, I, I thought that what he wanted us to feel was, gosh, isn't it awful that uh, people are being jerked around by Indira Gandhi and the Congress Party like this? Um, I felt uh, increasingly that they were being jerked around also by Rohit and Mystery in a very large way. Um, I mean, he starts off with an epigraph from Balzac, and, and clearly he has his ambition set on some sort of comedy humain level. Um, I, I didn't feel that that was what he achieved. It was, at best, Victor Hugo. So it was, something, it was, something, it was Les Mis without the music. Yeah. And if there is a fine balance, then the author's hand was in the pan. I must admit, I, I began completely enthralled by the characters, and he treated them so cruelly for so long that I began to despair and felt this is not true to India. Life to, uh, treating powerless, powerless people with immense cruelty. But that is not all India is about. But it is, and even no, if you've ever what been novel's in, about. I'm, when I went to India, I was actually do, I was doing a book and I was working a lot with the Family Planning Association of India, and we went into the Bastis. I looked into a Jhopti, and it was so much less terrible than I. I had feared. This is a book written by somebody who doesn't know the Busty. Well, and yet we he knows say, what he reads about. by an Indian writer who now lives in Canada. Maybe and that's has the lived there for the last. It's no. a Canadian book about India. What could be worse? What could be more I, I, terrible? I don't, think, I, don't, I don't think you can justify a novel on the basis of the fact that it's describing things that actually happened. It has to work as a novel. And I, I got very uh, tired of the fact that every single atrocity which occurred during the, the state of emergency happens to these characters in sequential order. Nothing ever happens twice, of course, because that would be to re repeat the exemplar which has already been given. All right. OK, let's move on then from a hint to the very last book on the list, which is also by far the favourite, which is Graham Swift's Last Orders. Um, Michael, do you like this better than The Mystery? Oh, yes. I mean, I like, yes, certainly a lot better, but I don't like it as much as The Seamus Dean. Um, it seems to me that what he's doing here is something which has become very common now in, in North America with, with uh, women writers, and one thinks of things like the Joy Luck Club, for example, or Waiting to Exhale, which is to take a group of people of the same gender and show them interacting. Um, and in a way, the result is, if you like, men behaving decently, which doesn't sound terribly exciting, and indeed it takes a little while, I think, for this book to get going. Um, I thought he's, he's, he's had a, a brave shot at giving a voice to people who are usually patronised or, or used as, as sort of comic walk-on characters in, in other people's books. I'm not completely convinced that that voice is maintained throughout. And indeed, the extract that we saw a moment ago about Smithfield Market seems to me uh, that this is Graham Swift's old editorialising schoolmasterish voice, which um, has, has been a problem for me with his writing before. But it is very true, isn't it, that over years of the Booker, one does not see many novels that tackle working class life and also old people in working class life. Tom yeah, Paulin. Yeah. No, it great, it's got great energy, it's got a it's tremendous sense of the wartime spirit, the spirit of the blitz, turned against life. Uh, there's a great phrase in the lick and spit of a human life. Uh, and it really moves very, very fast. It introduces a sort of parallel with the Canterbury Tales in, in a way. So there's a complete secular direction to it with a slightly religious frame to it, which I find interesting. At times, I felt the characters tended to blur for me. It was going so fast, like a very rapid dealing comedy. But, but it's as much an evocation of a generation as it is yeah. a set of individuals, isn't it? Yes, it is. Jermaine Greer. Well, one reason why the characters blur for you is the instrument that he has made, uh, the language that he has made them speak, which was driving me around the bend. They kept saying and, and then, and but. There was hardly a sentence that began without one or other of those. And people don't actually talk that way. And to make them talk that way, to put them in this linguistic straitjacket, was, I thought, condescension of a much more insidious kind. And they kept saying, it's like, blah, blah, blah. They couldn't say as if, although they occasionally did say as if. It's like, it's like that. It's it is like. occasionally very well written, and within and the limitations the, of its okay, own language, it really comes I to life. I really don't think... The, actually, you see, the thing is, you don't have to write in an actual language. You can make stage Irish, you can make literary Irish, and goodness knows Seamus Dean does it, and you could make literary Cockney too. Cockneys actually speak with dense levels of irony, lots of very tight little jokes, well, and I lots of... Lot of that happening in the book. I didn't think there was anywhere near enough. Michael did and defend it quickly for me. Well, I mean, I, I, all I can do is stand that argument on its head, and it, it seemed to me there was a lot of the uh, elliptical way, of, you know, that, that people of that class do speak to each other, and and where what is said is not what's meant. It's, it's, uh, it's at least possibly quite the opposite of what's, of, 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 of what's meant. A lot, a lot of stuff has to be picked up and understood. There's a, there's a clannish 
we're all in the gang together, secret language yeah, a aspect. A terrific communal Correct. feel to okay, it, exactly. I, exactly. I, I yeah. want to, I, we've, we've now talked about the books. I want to very briefly now talk about this list in general, because I know that Carmen feels very strongly she has a very good, healthy British list here. Michael Dibden, hmm? do you think the state of British fiction is in great hands based on these books? Well, God, I hope not, otherwise I'm going to start writing in Italian. Um, I mean, these, the, the, this is a list which is uh, looking at itself in the, in the rearview mirror. I mean, every single book here, in one way or another, is obsessed with the past, uh, politically or personally. What, one of the many reasons why I like The Seamus Dean is because it brings those two things together and projects it to the present. It shows how the past, you know, reacts on a situation which, as we all know only too well, um, is, is, is we're living with now. The, the, I have to believe there's more going on in British fiction on this list. OK, a last word, Tom, a last word. Well, I thought it was a very strong list, but there was a, there was a sort of Orwellian feel to the Swift as well, and that, that, that's part of the nostalgia theme. Uh, with the exception of Seamus Dean, yeah, that is a problem. All right, OK. <laughs> the Rosie, we, we, know who, we know who wants to win around this table. You are very soon going to discover who has actually won, in fact, I hand you back now to Tracy McLeod in Guildhall. Thanks, Sarah. And now Jonathan Taylor from Booker PLC will introduce the chair of the judging panel, publisher and writer Carmen Khalil. Chairman of the 1996 Book of Judges, Carmen Khalil, will now announce the winner. Carmen, and you have your... Right. It's a great honour to be here tonight to announce the winner of the 1996 Booker Prize for Fiction which I shall do in exactly three and a half minutes. But first, a tribute to my fellow judges, who were Jonathan Coe, the novelist, Ian Jack, formerly editor of The Independent on Sunday and now editor of Granta, the novelist A.L. Kennedy, and the novelist, biographer, and literary editor of The Evening Standard, A.N. Wilson. Each of them has worked for the prize well beyond the call of duty. My guess is that we read about 150 books this year to choose the winner. 103 novels were entered, we called in 20 more, and we read more than that. We read first novels, bad novels, experimental novels, postmodernist novels, novels of narrative exuberance, and those wonderful novels in which the past sheds light on the present. We read and we reread. However, we were never so exuberant as when reading our six shortlisted novels, which are Alias Grace by Margaret Atwood. Is there a novelist writing today who can equal Margaret Atwood's storytelling technique? Wry, delicate, with a center of steel. In this fascinating novel, through the travails of her 19th century heroine, Grace Marks, she lays bare our sexual and psychological mores then and now. Beryl Bainbridge is Every Man for Himself is a Jamesian mystery story which happens to take place on the Titanic. It is an allegory about riches and other dooms, elusive, beautifully written, a gazing into the abyss sort of novel, but as ever, Beryl Bainbridge manages to be very, very funny. Reading in the Dark by Seamus Dean tells the story of a boy growing up in a Catholic nationalist family in Derry in the 40s, 50s and 60s. Poetic, spare, the unravelling of this family mystery is also the mystery at the heart of Ireland's troubles. The writing in this astonishing first novel is of a beautiful simplicity. England in the 1950s is the setting for Sheena Mackay's The Orchard on Fire, a novel about childhood, about the longing we feel as adults for the certainties of childhood with its intensity of friendship and experience. This is an enchanting novel written in clear and glowing prose. Rohinton mysteries a fine balance 
is one of the greatest novels about India in many years. In this case, it is India of the 1970s. The word Dickensian is overused, but it should have been reserved to describe the scope of this absorbing epic and its compassion, humor, political passion, and above all, its magnificent and humane description of the lives of the poor. Last Orders by Graham Swift is a modern Canterbury tale in which a group of Bermondsey friends take the ashes of a butcher, Jack, to be disposed of at the end of Margate Pier. Each of the friends talk to us and their stories make a perfect whole. This is a beautifully constructed fresco of a novel about the richness of ordinary lives, affecting, funny and wise about life and death. Choosing between these exceptional novels was excruciating and impossible, but it's done, and the winner is Graham Swift, Last August. Graham Swift wins the 1996 Booker Prize for Fiction. Obviously delighted there. He was last shortlisted in 1983 for Waterland when the prize was won by Graham Quirtsey. But obviously this year a very popular winner. I think we're going to hear his acceptance speech now. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, I, I, th I think it's customary in this situation to uh, offer up thanks. Um, I would firstly like to thank uh, my lucky stars. Um, there, are, there are many people here I would like to thank, uh, and some who are not here, but I'm, I won't engage in a laborious list. There is one special group of people I would like to thank nonetheless, and they are not uh, directly represented here, although I think without them none of this could happen, and they are readers. Um, if I can speak at this moment for all novelists, including my good colleagues here tonight, I would like to thank the readers of all novels everywhere, um, but I would certainly like to thank my own readers. Uh, it's one of the ironies of the writer's trade that the very people we depend on most, uh, we seldom get to see, let alone meet, uh, and yet we expect from them a remarkable intimacy that they curl up with us and even take us to bed. Um, and of course, uh, novels are not written, they are not meant for such grand and public occasions as this, they are indeed meant for that intimate, silent, invisible, but potentially magical uh, point of contact between uh, the reader and the page. I have met some of my readers, and some of my readers have occasionally and amazingly written to me to thank me. It's not often that you get the chance to thank all of them publicly, but uh, in accepting this prize, I would like to do so now very warmly indeed. Thank you very much. Well, we are not infinite, silent, or invisible here as proper readers, but a very brief word, Jermaine. It's not readers who decide who wins the booker, it's publishers, because they put the book on the inside track at, from the very beginning. All right. Michael Dibden, are you pleased? I'm not sure I'm quite as cynical as uh, Jermaine. Um, I think he's a worthy winner. He was not my first choice, uh, but it's nice that he got it finally. 
Tom Pauling. Yeah, I agree with Ma Michael. Uh, I'm sorry Seamus Dean didn't get it, but w w well done, Graham Swift. Well, I think it's a really good novel, and I'm glad he's won. And I think everybody else thought it was a popular choice, too. Thank you very much indeed, Jermaine Greer, Michael Dibden, and Tom Pauling. And from all of us here at the Guildhall and Booker 96, good night.